I was a lost, rebellious hellion. And God began to work on my heart. And the Holy Spirit began to use different circumstances and events to bring conviction. And it was in October, 48 years ago, that I trusted Christ as Savior. Amen. And um, we talk about God being good. So praise the Lord for the good music, uh, Brother Ms. Watkins. That was a blessing. And I thank the Lord for the privilege to be here for really just a little over 24 hours. It just it goes so quick. Thank you, Pastor and Church, for the uh, uh, comfortable accommodations over at the inn. And they put a coffee, uh, a coffee pot in there for us with Keurig uh, K-Cups because the coffee over there probably is not very tasty. And uh, so we had good coffee and and good food and uh, good fellowship. Now, I do want you to know that it started last night. We uh, were, were promised this world-famous best hamburger that we would ever buy, we would ever taste anywhere on planet Earth. And so we bought in. Ben and I bought in. And we, we talked about it last night. I think I woke up at about 1.30. I said, hey, Ben, you thinking about that hamburger? He said, yeah, I was, I was just dreaming about it. And so I think we woke up again about 5, you know, and you're still thinking about that hamburger? Yeah, man. We, we ate just a meager breakfast so as not to spoil the room for this, this world-famous hamburger. And then, Pastor Frost, we came here. You guys ready to go get this hamburger? Yes, sir. We had it all ready. And the place was closed. <laughs> the place was closed. Do you feel bad, brother? I hope you feel bad. <laughs> because you missed out. Yeah, yeah. So we ate, we ate Mexican. So the moral of the story is that in Belfontin, Ohio, the next best thing to Don's Diner's hamburger is a fajita. Yeah. All right? So, but anyway, it was good. It was good. And I like Mexican, so, uh, and the uh, chips and the salsa, so it was good. And I'm just horsing around. We had a great time uh, of fellowship with your pastor at lunch today. And ladies, whoever helped prepare the food last night after the service, thank you. And it was delicious. We will, we will, unfortunately, my mother, 84 years old, had knee replacement a week ago today, and she has been in skilled nursing care since uh, Friday, and uh, she is getting dismissed tomorrow. So, Kristen, you know about the knee replacement stuff. In fact, I think you were helping mom after the accident when you were still recuperating from yours, or she helped you or something. I forget how it all worked out. But anyway, so she's getting dismissed tomorrow, and uh, so we're going to jump in the car tonight and head home, and I can be there in the morning to help pick her up and get her settled in her house. And uh, you know, when you're young, you're a young adult, you take care of your kids, and when you're an older adult, you take care of your parents, and you really do. So uh, we help take care of Dad. He passed away of Alzheimer's back in 18, a horrible, horrible thing. If you have anybody in your family with Alzheimer's, you know what that's like. But uh, so, so thankful that mom is up with us. And uh, so we will leave tonight. But thank you for all your kindnesses and uh, just the, the fellowship. Man, y'all have been friendly. And that speaks volumes about a church. So thank you very much. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you'll find that chapter there. And I want to draw your attention tonight. We're going to read three verses, but really I'm going to preach from the text of one verse in the, in the, of the three that we will read tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If you're able to stand, go ahead and do that in honor of God's Word. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 8, where the Word of God says, Paul writing here, And last of all, he was seen of me also, as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not meet to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. Now notice verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And I'd like to speak tonight on the subject, characteristics of biblical grace. 
characteristics of biblical grace. Let's pray together. Father, we give you the honor and glory tonight. Thank you for your spirits moving in the service already, the wonderful songs that we sang as a congregation that we enjoyed from Brother Mrs. Frost and then, Lord, from Brother Ms. Watkins. And it's just, Lord, it's prepared our hearts for this moment, I trust. Now I pray, God, that you'd give us your fullness of spirit power resting on speaker and listener. May the seed fall on good ground tonight and bring forth fruit that remains in our lives. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and be seated. In my opinion, and that's all it is, is my opinion. Okay, The most beautiful word in the Christian vocabulary is grace. Amen. I enjoyed Brother Watkins and his wife singing a couple of songs about grace there. And uh, that first thing on the list that that young man wrote was he's thankful for grace. And, you know, we think about the, the songs Amazing Grace. In fact, we call that our Baptist National Anthem. And then we have Grace Greater Than All Our Sin, that great song. And we understand the acrostic that we use, God's riches at Christ's expense. I like the, uh, the definition, the free and unmerited favor of God. I like Webster's 1828 definition. He called grace the divine influence on the heart. You got to contemplate that one for a little bit because without the divine influence on our old hearts, we just, we wouldn't have anything at all toward God. So I love the word grace, most, most beautiful word in the Christian vocabulary. Now, when you study the Bible, we use what's called the law of first mention. And when you go to, you search the word grace, the first time it's used, it's found in the book of Genesis chapter 6 and verse number 8 where the Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I just want to say, I'm not going to preach on that, but what an encouragement to you and me. As I said last night, as we slip and slide into times much like the days of Noah, what an encouragement to know that God's grace is just as available for us today as it was for Noah in that day. We can enjoy finding grace in the eyes of the Lord. So then you have the law of first mention, a couple of Bible study laws. The law of first mention, the law of repetition. You come to the law of repetition and you find here in this verse, number 10, that the word grace is used three times in the same verse. Now folks, uh, that's not because God ran out of something to say. That's for sake of emphasis. When you're reading the Word of God and you see a word or a phrase or a doctrine or even a person, brother, we were talking about different versions of the Bible today. Brother Frost was talking about how many times the name Jesus was taken out of the, the RSV, I think you said. And it's just incredible. But you find the same names over and over again. It's because God is, is emphasizing that person, that doctrine, that attribute, whatever it is that's being used over and over again. And so if there's something we can learn about grace in the Word of God, you would think it would be here in this verse where it is emphasized. And when I read verse number 10, it says to me that grace characterized Paul's life. It characterized his walk, and it had tremendous power and impact on his life. And people, it needs to have power and impact on our lives today. We talk about revival. We talked about that last night, that refreshing, that renewing, that restoring. We could use a real revival of God's biblical grace working powerfully in our lives. That is needed in our churches when it comes to the characteristics of biblical grace. Now, unfortunately, and again, I'm going I'm to veer off to my opinion for a minute. The, unfortunately, the doctrine of grace is not being used properly in a lot of even Baptist churches. It's being abused by so many in Christian circles today to justify a walk of life that's contrary to what Paul experienced. I'm sure, I'm sure it's in your area just like it is in our area. You can go about an hour's drive from our church, different directions, and you'll find four churches that are using grace as justification for contemporary living and ministry. And again, my opinion, they're not using it. They're abusing biblical grace. Now, the greatest abuse 
of any Bible doctrine is what's happening all over the and even the world in the name of grace, all right? Paul said in Galatians chapter 2, verse 22 or 21, he said, I do not frustrate the grace of God. That's an interesting verse. The word frustrate means to make null, to nullify, to render of no effect. I'm sure if you've owned a car for any period of time, this has probably happened to you at some point. You've used your car all day. You drive it home, put it in the garage, the carport, the drive, whatever. You turn off the engine, go into the house and spend your evening, get a good night's rest, wake up in the morning and shower and so forth and hopefully have your devotions and some breakfast. And then you go out to your car, you put the key in the ignition and you turn it and all you get is a or a whoop, whoop, whoop. And you realize, you look around, you wonder if you left the door open, did I leave the lights on, what in the world has happened, but you kind of know the story. You reach under the dash, you pull that little lever, it pops the hood a little bit, you get out of the car, go around to the front, you raise the hood the rest of the way, you find the battery, and there on the, the, the negative and, and positive post of that battery is all this whitish, uh, grayish, purplish gunk that's growing and you know right away what the problem is. You get your tools. In the old days, you'd go in the house and get a Coca-Cola and a toothbrush. And uh, then you'd loosen those clamps and take those cables off the posts and you'd use that uh, Coca-Cola or baking soda or whatever you got and you'd shine up those posts real brightly, shine up the clamps real brightly, put the clamps back on there, tighten them down, lower the hood, get back in the car, vroom, starts right up. There was nothing wrong with the power in that battery. There was enough battery to turn that motor over and get it started. The problem was it was frustrated. It was nullified. It was made void. It was rendered of no effect because of all the gunk growing on the post on the battery. Now, can you imagine the power of grace being made of no effect in a person's life? But that's the honest truth. That's what happens to God's people. It's what happens. Now, Paul, we understand in Galatians chapter 2, Paul was talking about saving grace. And when you add keeping the law, when you add getting baptized, when you add praying the rosary, when you add taking communion to grace, when you add anything to grace, it nullifies the power of grace. Frustrates the power of grace. I understand that. But there is more than just saving grace. There's all kinds of grace. And those who are changing the characteristics of Bible grace are nullifying the power of it in their lives. And the power of biblical grace is unchanged. But they are personally frustrating the power of it. Now I want to show you what Paul testified about the power of grace in his own words. First of all, Paul said grace did something for him. It did something for him. Look at the first phrase of verse 10. He wrote, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. Yeah. Now, what was Paul? Well, he was a preacher who used to be a persecutor. Yeah. He was a murderer who was now a missionary. From persecutor to preacher, from murderer to missionary, what, pers- what, what facilitated that change? Grace facilitated that change in the Apostle Paul. Grace did something for him. It changed him from Saul of Tarsus to Paul the Apostle. It was grace that did something for Paul. It changed him. Now listen, not everybody is a persecutor before they get saved. Not everybody becomes a preacher after they get saved. But people, according to the Word of God, Grace does something for everybody who gets saved. In some way, it changes them. I'm talking, look at these these little five and six year old children who trust, now they're not giving up, they're not giving up drugs and they're not quitting, they're not stopped drinking and all those things, but there is a change in the heart and life of a little five and six year old boy or girl who gets saved because that's what grace does. It changes people. It does something for people. Now I know I'm not preaching to a novice crowd. I know you understand the three what we call I have the different words maybe elements or whatever of salvation but you take the matter of justification. 
Justification is a great Bible doctrine that falls under the umbrella of salvation. Paul said in Romans 3.24, being justified freely by His grace. Justification is that moment in time when you and I repented of our sin and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ through His death, burial, and resurrection to save us from our sin. Amen. At that moment in time, at that moment, in, that was a moment in time, yep. we were justified. Yep. Yeah. Justified in the eyes of God freely yep. by His grace. Yep. In the eyes of God it is just as if I'd never sinned. You think about that for a minute. That's unbelievable. That's justification. What, what, what facilitated justification? What empowered justification? Grace did. Being justified freely by His grace. And when you and I got justified, a change took place in us. You know, and, look, and I understand... I understand that nowadays, especially when you're dealing with people who, folks, we, I'm sure it's the same here. We're, we are dealing with people now, 18, 20 years of age, who've never darkened the door of a church. They, don't, they do not know the first thing about God. Not the first thing. And they're involved in all the stuff that the world has to offer, all the emptiness of their life. And when they get saved, they bring a lot of baggage with them. And you know what? It takes patience. It takes long-suffering and doctrine. And that's how you're supposed to preach and work with people. Okay? But I want to say this. I understand. It take, I got saved at 18 in a boy's home. I was a hellion. I'm not proud of it, but that's what I was, and I brought a lot of baggage with me. Thank God, some of that baggage fell off immediately. Amen. Couple of Amen. couple of things, couple of things. It took a while. Come on. It just did. Yeah. But I want to say this: I served out in Iowa under Brother Brown for ten years in Washington, Washington County, Iowa, was known for years as the number one hog producing county in America. That's what we were known for pigs. If I saw one pig, we had, we had 19 either full-time farmers or men who were involved in agriculture as members of the church and others who were associated with it somehow. I mean, it was, it was we're in, the, in a town of 6,500, county of 19,000. If I saw one pig, I saw thousands, and I'm not exaggerating, thousands. And, I mean, we had men in the church that has those, had those confinement from Pharaoh to finish, Thousands of hogs a year sending hogs to the market, semi-loads full. I helped my father-in-law load semi-loads full of hogs two or three times. Worked in his hog house for him two or three times when he needed some help. I mean, I saw thousands of hogs. And I'm not, not exaggerating. Out of all those thousands of hogs, I never saw one unhappy hog in a mud puddle. Never, never did. In fact, the way God made their jowls, and their, their, it's almost like they're smiling. Just as happy as they could be. And those boys would take those hogs and clean them up for the 4-H at 4-H, the 4-H fair. They'd take them back home as soon as they'd turn them loose, you know, where they went right back. Because that's their what? Thank you. But in all those years in Iowa, I never one time saw an, a happy sheep in a mud puddle. They, didn't, they weren't looking for the mud puddle. Because that's not a sheep's nature. I don't, I don't like men who come in and try to make people doubt their salvation and, you know, put them on a guilt trip because they don't remember the exact second they trusted. I don't like that. Don't intend to do that. I do want to say this, that if, if a person can continue on in the mud puddle and enjoy it, something's not right. Because Pastor Frost... Even some of those things that I had a difficult time giving up after salvation, I never enjoyed it like I did when I was lost. Does that make sense to y'all? You know why? Because grace did something for me. It changed me. All right, we understand that. Justification. So all I say tonight in this room full of folk here tonight, I just trust there's been a time in your life you go back to when you were justified. 
When you trusted Christ as your Savior and you nail it down, you know He's your Savior, you are justified freely by His grace. He did something for you. Now, we also understand glorification. Glorification is that moment in time, right? This is a moment in time. Boom. Glorification is a moment in time when we see Jesus. If we go by way of the grave or by way of the rapture, when we see Jesus, we're going to be changed. Second, all right, second, first, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, he talks about it in verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, listen, what that means is, to put it, to put it simply and shorten the time, is we're going, to be cha- we're going to receive our glorified body. We're going to have this vile body. It's going to be changed to his, likened unto his glorious body. And that's, going to, that's going to take place in the twink. The twinkling, not a wink or a blink, but a twink. A wink is a conscious thing. Sometimes I'll think, boy, my wife's pretty. And I wink at her. That's something conscious. A, a blink is kind of an instinctive reaction, isn't it? Somebody, the, the fly flies by and you're, you blink. You didn't think about it. But a twink? Somebody said the twinkling of an eye is what the time it takes for a ray of light to enter the pupil and refract off the retina. That's a twink. Uh, synonym, fast. Fast. Super fast. And in the twinkling of an eye, we are going to be changed, and that change takes place by God's grace. I can't work that up any more than I could work up justification. Justification is not a work. It's grace. Glorification is not a work. It's grace. Can you imagine? That's going to be so wonderful. No more cancer, no more, not even a cold, no more aspirins needed, no more dentists. Amen. Oh, with all the technology and modern that we have in this world, they can do nothing to make a dentist office smell or sound any different. As soon as you open the door, I'm at the dentist, blindfold me, take me around in circles, put me into a dentist office, I will know where I am immediately. I made the mistake one time. I said, can you imagine in heaven, no more dentist. And there was a dentist sitting in the crowd. So I have to be careful. No more dentist office. Okay. And the best of all, it's not just the physical change. This robe of flesh, I'll drop and rise. No more sin nature. No more temptation to lie. No more temptation to be lazy, to criticize or gossip, to lust, whatever. Gone. Wow. (laughs) I can't can't work that up. You can't work that up. That's a work of grace. Um, That's a moment in time. A quick moment. Justification is a moment in time. Glorification is a moment in time. That's when we got saved. This is when we see Christ. What about this time period right here? We've got the word sanctification. Sanctification is different than justification and glorification. It's not a moment in time. Positionally it is. But practically, it's a work in progress. The Bible talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 18. But we all... With open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. What that verse is teaching is, after we're justified, before we're glorified, as we look into the glass and we see Jesus Christ, that reflection of Christ should work on us and move on us 
and it should change us little by little by little by little. It should make us more and more like Jesus and less and less like the world. More and more like what we're going to be, less and less like what we used to be. You all with me tonight? You understand what I'm saying? And you know what? The abuse of grace is not really happening at justification. The abuse of grace is not really happening at glorification. Grace is being abused right here in this area known as sanctification because grace is being used to justify living like the world. Well, I'm under grace. I'm not under, I'm under grace. Excuse me. Grace changed us when it justified us. Grace will change us when it glorifies us. And grace should change us in this period of time between justification and glorification. Grace should be changing us from glory to glory. Look, hold your finger here. Look at Titus chapter 2 with me real quick. Just, just quickly. I won't be there long. We'll be there. We'll touch base and then go. Titus chapter 2. If you like to mark your Bible with words or something in the margin, I think this would be a good place to write a couple, three words in here. I want you to look at verse number 11 where Paul wrote to Titus chapter 2 verse 11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That's justification right there. That's talking about salvation. All right, you can write justification besides verse 11. And by the way, I like where it says, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We have a whosoever will gospel. I can defend it in many places. All I really need is one verse, Isaiah 53, 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. That verse starts with all, and it ends with all. And if you fit into the first all, you fit into the last all. That's what it is. Case done. That's talking about justification. Verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. What's that? That's glorification. Okay? So verse 11 is justification. Verse 13 is glorification. But there's verse 12 in the middle. Teaching us. That denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. We should deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should not live like we used to live. We should live right, soberly, righteously, and godly. We should live like we're going to live when we're totally glorified. We, we, we'll never get there on planet Earth completely. But why are, we, why are we using grace to justify being here when we ought to be in the process of being over here? Why are we doing that? And we're not doing it. But others are, but I don't want to take the, take the, you know, take the attitude, it won't happen here, Brother Frost. It's happened to people in my, folks who sat in our pews for 20 years. That's right. Left to go to places where the first picture I got was his ninth grade son at a teen activity 80s night at this, this non-denominational, all this loose end living grace church. And here was 80s night and all these girls in hot pants and halter tops and his boy right in the middle of them. Oh, but we're under grace, Brother Angel. We're under grace. What is that, some kind of spooky, warm, warm and fuzzy feeling that just allows for, allows for us to live worldly? I'm sorry. Paul said grace teaches us to deny that. Tonight, walk away from it. And I love the language of the verse. In this 
present world. Well, that was back in the first century when Paul was writing to Titus. Folks, this book did not expire at the end of the first century. It didn't expire at the end of the 18th century. It didn't expire at Y2K. It, it, it is a living book. When it says in this present world, it's talking about August 29, 2023. God's people, by the power of his grace, should live less and less worldly and more and more like Christ. Can you tell I'm up to here? <laughs> I'm up to here with it, man. Grace has never, does not now, nor ever will embrace worldliness. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Grace empowers godliness. In this present world, we can go back to 1 Corinthians. Grace still empowers godliness today. Some people say, well, Brother hey, Terry, the culture has changed and things are different. Yep. But grace is the same. I want to say something. Listen carefully. Grace always confronts the culture. It never capitulates to it. And grace does not influence culture by God's people becoming like the culture. Grace influences culture by God's people becoming like Christ in both body and spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, which are God's. That's inside, outside. That's internal, external. Well, but we're under grace, brother. This is the day of grace. We are not under law. We're under grace. Yes, I remember that. I remember Jesus talking about that. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, You have heard that it hath been said, but I say unto you. You have heard that it hath been said, but I say unto you. And every time he compared to what had been said to what he said, he raised the bar. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. Pastors, evangelists, missionaries on different continents justifying changes in music and dress and behavior by abusing grace. My question is, where are they hearing this? Where are they reading this? Their arguments are too similar to be coincidental. That family that left after 20 years, when they came in and started talking, I just interrupted them. I said, here, let me write the rest of it out for you. Because it's the same song, just a new verse. I can write the words for you. I can write what you're going to say. I can write where you're going to end up. It's an abuse of grace. You know, 48 years ago, that's 1975, folks. I mentioned last night there's a lot of men in ministry today who were saved in their 70s. I saved in the 70s, okay, in the 1970s. When I walked into Calvary Baptist Church in Graysville, Tennessee, I walked to an independent Baptist church that was radically different from the world I was living in. Not today. You don't hear what we heard tonight. That music glorified God. What you got tonight, what you, you walk in, the ceiling's black, the lights are low, the smoke is going. There's no pulpit. There's no pulpit drums and rocked out music and everybody's wearing blue jeans with slits in them. You know, my mother made us change our pants when we had slits in our blue jeans. Pajama pants. Folks, come on. You know, we're numb. We're numb to it. It's an abuse of God's Grace. Now, I'm going to quit on this point and get to the next. And the last two aren't near as long as the first one, so you can relax, okay? They're quick. But here's a fair question. So when is the, if this is what's supposed to be happening right now between justification and glorification, when is the last time that grace changed us? I mean, yeah, we go to the altar. I'm for that. I preached on that Sunday morning at our church. Don't take the invitation out of a church yeah. service. That's right. Yeah. That's right. When was the last time we did more than just go to the altar? When we left the service, grace had changed us. Mm-hmm. 
I, I, I won't go into it, don't have time, but just, you know, there came a point in time in, in, in our marriage, we never throw the word divorce at each other. We've been married 44 years now. We've never thrown the word divorce at each other. We've never stomped off mad, gone to her parents or mine. We never have done that by, by God's grace. But there was a time when God sped, said to me, if this does not get fixed, and it was not something moral, it was my, it was my hurtful words and the tone of my voice. And God said, if this doesn't get fixed, your marriage will never be what I want it to be. And I can't stand here tonight and claim 100%, 100% change. But I can stand here tonight and say, I am not what I was. So, well, you just worked it up. No, I did not. God's grace came down and changed it. That's right. Good, Good. Grace did something for me. Grace does not make us less consecrated. It makes us more consecrated. Number two, and it won't be long. Grace did something to him. Paul said grace did something to me. Look at what he said. He said his grace, second time he uses the word, which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I, I did what? Labored? I, I labored? Grace and labor? Grace and service? Grace and work? Grace and minister? I labored more abundantly than they all. How unfortunate to associate grace with that dirty word labor. But God said, Paul said, God's grace made him serve. Amen. Grace made him work. Grace made Paul strive to do more, not less. It worked in him. And this was approximately 30 years after he got saved. He was still laboring. He was still serving. And it wasn't a rule book. It wasn't a I have to. It was I get to. Amen. Because grace was at work in his life. Far too often we talk about grace in the past tense. I got saved by grace. Yes, you did. But what is grace doing in your heart and life right now? Do you have a longing to serve God in some capacity? You know what that's the result of? God's grace. God's grace. That's what that's the result of, all right? Now we're hearing that grace is justification for less commitment. I don't have to go to church. I'm under grace. I don't have to be at the services. I don't have to do anything. I'm, I'm under grace. Well, this grace thing is pretty amazing. It allows us to be less consecrated, less committed. What part of human nature doesn't like that? We all like that, but that's not what God's grace does. God's grace makes us serve, makes us labor, makes us work. You know, not everybody is called to full-time ministry, but everybody is called to be a full-time Christian. A full-time Christian means serve. God uses in, the word of, in His Word, God uses the physical body to teach us about the local church. Jesus is the head. Everything that happens throughout this body starts right here. Right? This is it, right here. Okay? If I'm in an accident, I'm brain dead, what happens? Take the plug out, what happens? I pass away. Heart quits beating, lungs quit breathing. It's because it all originates right here. Jesus is the head. He's the, Pastor Frost is not the head of Solid Rock Baptist Church. Jesus is. All the orders, all the things that take place should come from the head through the under shepherd to the church body. Amen. By His grace, God put a lot of physical members into one body that makes up the body of Terry Angel. Some of the members you can see, some of the more vital members you can't see. I can live without a hand, I can't live without a heart. Okay? But God put everything in this human body for a purpose, even your appendix, even your tonsils. They used to just rip the tonsils out of little kids until they finally decided, you know what, there's a purpose for those things. I thank God you can live without them if you have to. But I'd hate to be the tonsil or the app appendix of a local church. <laughs> think about that for a minute. Okay? So, God, okay. so my father-in-law, I mentioned my father-in-law, he's a farmer, okay? He's retired now, he's 91. I've never known my father-in-law with his right hand. Day after Christmas, 68 or 69, he lost it in a, in, a, in a, 
He had corn shellers before the days of combines. And it, his glove got caught in the auger and, and he lost it. his arm. Is, from here down, he lost his arm. I've never known him with this right hand. I've seen pictures of him, but never have shaken his right hand. That man worked like crazy. Had a farm, pigs, turkeys, had one time sheep, cow. I mean, he, he delivered feed. He did it all until it came time to button this button. He couldn't do it. He couldn't button this one. He had to have his wife, the dear sweet German lady, Nellie, button that button for him and button this button because he didn't have this member. As much as he was able to do, he did not, he could not live up to his full potential physically. Brother Frost, there is not a Baptist church in the world, yours, mine included, that's living up to its full potential. I'm not saying we're not accomplishing anything. I'm saying full potential. You know why? Because we got members. Members that are not active. And you know what, folks? Physical changes take place. Bodies grow old. You can't always do what you used to do. But there is a place in Solid Rock Baptist Church. If you're a member here, there's something for you to do. And it shouldn't take Pastor Frost grabbing you by the arm, twisting it behind your back and begging. People should be knocking on his door saying, Pastor, what could I do to serve Christ at Solid Rock Baptist Church? And you know what motivates that, brother? According to Paul, grace. And by the way, let me just add, if you do go to Pastor Frost and say, what can I do? Be satisfied with his answer. Amen. <laughs> so, so many times people, Pastor, I'd like to do, well, brother, you know what? How about this? Well, I'm not really not interested. Grace takes all that away. That's right. Grace just said whatever I can do to serve Christ. That's grace. That's the power of grace. It did something for Paul, did something to Paul. Number three, the end of the verse, grace did something through him. Look at what he says. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. And that's an interesting statement, isn't it? Because he had just said, I labored more abundantly than they all. Boy, that's a prideful statement. Wait a minute. That's under inspiration. And folks... It's true. Who had more fruit for Christ in the first century than the Apostle Paul? But what did he follow that up with? Yet not I, but the grace of God through me. Amen. Do you know what we experienced tonight when this couple got up a few, a few a little bit ago? Well, they got talent and they got a bit. You know what we experienced tonight? We experienced God's grace. That's right. That's it. That is right. Yeah, that is right. Through them. That's right. And when your Sunday school teacher stands up, I saw that board in there in the prayer room. I said, who wrote on that board? Some child just wrote all over that board. There's Brother Joe. I thought, man, that's a Sunday school. That's not a lesson. That's a series. And I understand it's been going on for 10 years, Tony. Amen. If you're in that class and God ministers to you, yes, he put the time in, he put the study in, but you know what happens when you get ministered to through his Sunday school lesson? That's God's grace. And you know that, brother. You know that, you know that happens when you preach. You know that happens when you sing. It's not us. It's God's grace through us. And listen, church member, it may not be God's grace through you in singing. It might be God's grace through you in changing diapers in the nursery. Or helping little kids. Or mowing the lawn. Or painting the building. Or waxing and mopping the floor. Straightening the chairs and make sure. I came in here, you know what I noticed? 
When I came in the first time, I noticed all these envelopes were put in all these places. They didn't just slop me in there. They're all straight. There's a place for you. And with what God wants to do through you. 1997, 98, I went to Buenos Aires, Argentina, my wife and me, to be with Brother Keith Harrison and his wife Judy and their work there. And Keith held a big conference and missionaries from all over South America came and a missionary representative was there and he had been working in a Latin American country and he told this story about a missionary who grew up, he, he, was, he lived here in Ohio in, in an area much like this, just kind of a rural area. Had done well in life, kind of upper middle class, had a nice ranch uh, home and property and, and at his independent Baptist church during missions conference, God just broke him and the, last night he went forward got on his knees and surrendered to the mission field. While he was praying, he felt somebody beside him. He looked behind, behind him. It was his wife, and she had his hand, had her hand on his, his back, and she said, sweetheart, whatever God's doing, I'm with you. He said, well, we're going to the mission field. They went. They put their things up for sale. They went to Caracas, Venezuela. She was an interior decorator. She had made this beautiful purple curtain, had it over the bay window in their great room, and she asked, honey, can I take the curtain with me? It's, it just, it, it's home. He said, absolutely. So with all their stuff, they boxed it up and took it to Caracas. They moved into that third world country, that third world city, in a modest home. First thing she did when she got there, took that curtain and put it up, and they had a successful ministry in Caracas in the capital city. But he got a burden for the mountains and the villages. In some cases, the gospel had never gone to those remote places. And he told his wife, he said, honey, we're packing up. We're going to the mountains. God's moving us there. He moved into a village. You've seen the slides of the grass huts, right? No windows. Because the village people believed if you had windows, demon spirits, devil spirits came in through the window. He took a saw and he saw a crude opening in the side of his hut to show that his God was greater than any devil spirit. He did find she struggled. She kept the, box, the, the, the purple curtain, stayed in the box under the bed. She struggled. It was rough. She had some experience as a midwife. One day a little Venezuelan Indian woman was giving birth to a child. Another little lady was helping her. And when the, when the child was born, all of its organs were on the outside of its body. It was obvious it wasn't going to live. So she did the best she could, snipped the umbilical cord, did, did what she could, put the baby on the, the mother's body and just, well, it didn't have nothing to do. And turned around, a little sink attached, a little tin thing attached to the wall and trying to wash her hands. And she heard a, a groveling, a snarling, a growling. And to her heart, she turned around to her horror. That little Indian lady that was helping her had taken that baby and thrown it to a pack of wild dogs. And they were eating it because they believed that that baby was demon-possessed. And, and she lost it. The missionary wife lost it. And he said that she went to her little hut and she fell on her knees beside her bed and she just cried and prayed, I can't do this. I can't do this. I can't do this. And you can understand, especially you ladies, you can understand. And, and I don't, she stayed there for some time. I don't want to say hell, I don't know, don't remember. But he said, when she got through praying, she reached under that bed, took that box, took that curtain out, put it over that hole, and they stayed. And they evangelized that village and the next village and the next village. You say, Brother Terry, how in the world can a woman from upper middle class Ohio, United States of America, stay in a place where they throw little handicapped babies to dogs? She came. But the grace of God through her. The grace of God through her can. That's right. 
if you're a member of this church and you sit here and you think, you know, I really can't do anything for God, you're right. But all you have to do is present yourself and let God's grace work through you. It'll do something through you. Yeah. Isn't grace a beautiful word? Isn't it a better power? if it's defined biblically, if it's used biblically. Grace does something for us, to us, through us. Amen. Father, bless the message to our hearts tonight. I thank you for the attention of the people, the spirit of the service. And Lord, we just give the invitation to you. I pray, God, that you'll speak to our hearts. Lord, I ask that if anybody here tonight is lost, that they would come and trust Christ and be saved. Maybe there's a person here, Lord, who should, who should find some place of service. Maybe, the grace, maybe it's been too long since grace changed us and made us more like Jesus. God, just help us tonight not to abuse grace, but to use it properly, to let it work in our lives. Thank you for the power of amazing grace. In Jesus' name. If you're lost, please say something to Pastor Frost tonight. If you want God's grace to change you and do something through you and to you, just come tonight, sit, kneel, whatever you can do, and talk to the Lord. The music begins. We'll stand while some are praying. <laughs>